So yeah, hi. Um, I'm my name is Gabriel Bentley, and I uh, I actually work at Delta Dental as an interactive designer. Um, and I am a recent grad, but I've been working in uh, web design for about ten years now. Um, and one of the things that I use it in the many different things that I'm involved with is is actually a, a JavaScript framework and library called D3 that's uh, useful for. It's specifically useful for doing charts, but it actually does a whole ton of different things if you use it in different ways. So um, what D3 stands for is uh, data-driven documents, um, which means that it's particularly intended for doing anything that's related to uh, data. So anytime you have data, you can take that and attach it to some kind of document on the web and use it to output pretty much whatever, which a large focus of that is on doing different interactive charts and stuff. Um, so I have a number of different examples of these are some of the different uses that I've used it for, and then I have several examples of things that I, other people have built with it. Um, yeah. So for example, um, Delta Dental is a dental insurance company. We have to do an annual report every year that shows people a bunch of different statistics about us and everything. Um, and we actually use D3 to do some of these kinds of charts. These are very simple, not terribly interactive ones, but they are built using D3 because it makes them automatically responsive. So, or well, with a little bit of work, it makes them responsive so that we can have this work all the way down to mobile phones. It works on tablets. It works on everything. Um, and like various different times where we have interactivity, if we want to have a tree map that shows tons of nested data inside one little piece, we can do that with, with D3 fairly easily. Um, another example is uh, we use it in user testing. This was a test I did while I was here. Um, but we do the same thing at work, which is when we're going through uh, testing a website to see how easy it is for people to find stuff. Um, usually you'd want to do an eye tracking study for that, but in some cases, uh, or in a lot of cases, eye tracking is too expensive and too formal um, to really just quickly get an idea of how people are using it. But there's an extremely strong correlation between uh, people's eye movements and their cursor movements on screen. And so what we can do is record their cursor movements as they use a website, and then we just use a fairly simple D3 program that outputs vectors of exactly what they did, and we can print these out or whatever. And it's actually a chart of every page they visited here and all the things they did there. The greens are just places that they focused on a lot, and then the reds are spots that they were clicking on and stuff. So obviously this person was a bit confused. Um, speaking of people that are confused, sometimes it's helpful for us to be able to uh, chart how somebody went through a particular website. And we do that by using actually the same data set that you saw before, except this is what's called a force-directed diagram. So it actually uses this super complicated math that you don't need to know to make it work. Um, but it's uh, simultaneously repelling and attracting these different dots, and then the connections between them affect those repulsions and stuff. Uh, and this is a person looking for this particular page. Um, and obviously it took them quite a bit of work to get there, so that's kind of a bad sign. Um, but that all we had to do for that is record every page they went to and which page they were coming from and going to, and those two lists together, can we can plug them in there and end up with that. Um, I've also used it in different projects. Like we are looking at one point about um, how this was used for water, but uh, how it's influenced the city. And you can, what it does is lets you insert different words, and it will automatically filter through all of the, um, make sure I'm spelling stuff right. It'll automatically fil filter through all the streets and start uh, populating just the streets that have those words in their name. Um, so you can quickly add like words that are related to water, and then you start getting more and more of the map, and what you find is when you go through and do this for the entire city, it actually lays out a pretty good idea of the, the structure of the city, the main structure anyway. It has most of the bounds, and it has like those main roads through it, um, also built with D3. Uh, so that's some stuff that I've done with it. Other people have done some really crazy stuff. Uh, this, um, 
This is a chart of all of the most common words in the Christmas Carol and all the words that follow them. Um, and it's similar in structure in terms of the data to the, la the force directed diagram I showed you, but a completely different realization and different use of the same kind of setup. Um, then there's uh, this is somebody just doing a basic chart of every uh, every letter that was typed and like the correlations between when they type each letter and the next letter and stuff. Um, you can actually build simple games with it. So this is a game where you are responsible for, um, it's actually really good color practice, you're responsible for picking the same color as the one that uh, they're showing you. And then they give you a score on how well you did that for each one. And it gets more and more complicated to the point where you're picking multiple different colors at the same time and everything. So it's fun. Um, this is a chart of all the different ways that Obama could have won the White House. And actually during the election, they had this automatically updating in real time for each time the vote counts came in. And it would show you this is how it's actually going um, through these different paths. And it's kind of a cool, they have a bunch of different stuff you can explore there. Um, and then this chart, I'll show you a simple version of how this chart is built a little bit later, but this is showing, depending on when you bought your house, uh, how much as a percentage would your house price have changed? Um, so if you bought your house in year 2000, then you'd have a 71% increase in your uh, the value of your house on average in the US, and each one of these different lines represents a different location. Um, and by dragging the lines along, you can change the point at which it's basing that percentage change on. Uh, which is kind of an interesting, simple use of it. Uh, and then finally, this is a, a super interesting article. It's really long. Uh, but if you like um, algorithms at all, which they're, they do a really good job of explaining. This is actually the guy who created D3 wrote this. And um, he explains how something like this actually works. So if you watch it do its thing, then you can come down here and see, okay, this is actually how it's working. He goes into detail explaining how these different algorithms function and how good they are at replicating different things. Um, and they all behave a little bit differently. Some of them kind of grow like this one. Um, and some of them come in more randomly like some of the other ones. This one is showing how that works. They have sorting algorithms. They have a whole exploration on how RAND, if you're using most programming languages, not actually random. Um, and actually maze generation algorithms as well, uh, explaining how good each different one is at generating good quality mazes that are hard. Um, and you can see how they work. So yeah, that's a little bit about the broadness of stuff that you can do with D3. All of these graphics are done with D3. Um, but what D3 actually is, is not a charting library, which is part of what makes it so powerful. It's actually a, an SVG DOM manipulation library, which means that um, if you know anything about SVGs, they're actually a text code that represents different graphics in vector. Um, and D3 is capable of generating those for you and attaching data to them to allow you to control different aspects of them. Um, and how does it do that? It does that through a uh, simple code like this. So this is a basic SVG. It's just producing a circle. It has a tag called SVG that says, this is what I am. And then it has a tag called circle that creates a circle. Um, each one of those different tags is then, or it has different attributes on it. And those attributes are like height and width and center point and radius and styling and that kind of stuff. And that produces a circle similar to the one you see over there. Um, and then you combine that with D3, the actual JavaScript library, and it does stuff like this, where you can say, select this object from my HTML and do whatever with it. HTML is one of the things you can do. That's insert this uh, HTML inside of that object, but you can do lots and lots of different things with it. Um, and because it's JavaScript, you can combine it with basic JavaScript functions like this. Uh, where, say, we're doing that other chart where we need to get 
the percentage difference between some point and whatever value we're doing right now, we can just automate that by building, literally, here's the function that determines what that difference is, and we'll just pass it each data point, and it'll get us back the result, and then you just add that to the chart. So that's what this thing is and does, and I'll show you a couple of examples of how that works. Um, usually your data comes in a very complicated looking format called JSON. Uh, if you're talking to pretty much any API on the web nowadays, you're going to get JSON responses back. Um, and this is a particularly complicated one. This one's for weather data, but you can get them for uh, weather, BART, Muni, like various different uh, social service or social media sites use this format for their APIs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so what you usually want to do is you want to break that down into a, a format that's a little easier to work with. So in that case, we have this huge pile of data and we just want to break it down to, okay, we just want the um, current temperature or the current temperature forecast for the next week. So D3 has this function for getting, uh, getting data from places, which is just D3 dot, in this case, JSON, it could be dot CSV, it could be dot XML. Um, there's a bunch of different parsers, but you tell it what you want to get, and then you tell it where to get it, uh, which is this piece, and then you tell it what to do with that data once you have it. So here, we take this original data, um, which is a super complicated object, and instead pick out just the daily data from that. Um, and then we can actually look and see when it runs, here's the daily data being processed. Um, and there's our still super, fairly complicated, but much simpler setup of each one of these objects is a day, and it has all of these different attributes that we can pull from it. Um, and then, because it's basic JavaScript, you can loop through that and say, okay, now I want to grab only the temperature min, the temperature max, and the date um, with a little bit of reformatting. Uh, and then output that. And then again, going back here, we can see on this bottom object, this one, which is now down to our much simpler format of just minimum temperature, or low temp, high temp, and the date. From there, you can go back and do all kinds of other stuff. So let's go to a, a simpler example. Say we have a, an SVG circle like we talked about before, and we want to do some manipulation with it, like we'll try to animate it. Um, well, D3 makes that relatively easy, too. You can just type D3 uh, select, because we want to get something, and we're going to select that uh, circle which you can see I've assigned the circle ID here. Um, and then we're going to change some attribute on it. We're going to say attribute. We're going to grab, in this case, the radius and make that, say, 10 instead of what it currently is. And suddenly it gets smaller. But that happens instantly because we're just telling it to do it right as soon as this page loads. Um, when you get into animation, this is the fun part, uh, you can just say transition, and now it's an animation, um, by adding a duration of, and this is in thousandths of a second, so if I add a thousand, suddenly it's slower. Uh, if you normally had to do this with basic JavaScript, it's much more complicated. This thing that's taking three lines of code to do just this simple transition actually requires saving your start value, your end value, and then looping through each frame with an interval that says, okay, every 10th or 10,000th of a second, then do this thing, and it gets much more complicated. So by having D3 so that we can just give it these simple things that say change some attributes on this, um, and it will do a, an animation for us, and in fact, we can, um, we can throw multiple different attributes at it, and it will change more than one at the same time. Um, so let's change its center point to 30, for example. Um, suddenly it has a more complicated animation. So you can keep layering these things up, and they can all be programmatically added. So that's the very basics of how, even though D3 does a lot of charting, it also is useful in these ways as well. Um, and because you can do these super basic transforms with it, you can actually make super complicated graphics 
like, for example, this one, um, which looks like a basic chart. It's just charting the highs and lows of the weather over the next week uh, at Alcatraz specifically. Um, but when we hover over it, it'll automatically change. Um, and now it's charting percentage change from now to whenever the endpoint is. And along the bottom, you'll see there's the how much the highs and lows are going to change based on that. Um, and the center or the point that I'm hovering over is the day that I want it to judge based on, um, which is at its core the same kind of chart as the one that we saw before. But this one's kind of a simpler version of that same thing. Um, so to make a chart like that, you kind of break it down into different steps that you need to do. So you start off by uh, getting the data, and then you want to reformat. And then you'll draw the initial version, and then you add mouse events to that which just means every time that the mouse does something, you're going to do something in response. Um, and then you actually write the uh, mouse transitions. Um, and so just to give you an idea, it will be kind of a long, complicated looking page. But to give you an idea of how this actually works, I have that working here. Um, let's go up to the top of that. Uh, so there's the get data like you saw before. There's the format data same as before, um, and it's going to return that. And then these are just some defaults for how it's going to scale things, how it's going to scale the line, that kind of stuff, um, and how it creates your curves and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you actually create the SVG, add the axes to it, um, add the various different lines to it, and then you have your basic, like that'll come out just like this with nothing else. Um, and then from there, you can add all of your functions for here's when I'm drawing it as percentage, which is the same thing, except it processes the data in advance and figures out what the high and low are and what the change is. And then it just simply does the transition duration and re-requests the, the line uh, for each of those. And it adds uh, your mouse events to that, which are here. So every time there's a mouse over, run this function. Every time there's a mouse move, run this function, etc. So it's definitely a much more complicated page to make something like that work. But because it's complicated like that, you can do almost anything with it as long as you have the right stuff to generate. Um, so yeah. I, but it also means that you can interact with stuff from, say, Illustrator. Oops. because Illustrator has an SVG export function. Um, and as you know, when you're drawing an Illustrator, you're drawing vectors. Uh, so you can take those vectors, you can pull them into HTML files, and then directly interact with them um, to change styles of them and animate them and that kind of stuff. Uh, and we're going to do that really quick with the circle, so you can see. So I'll create a new document. And add a circle to it. And go to fill, and then let's make a stroke a little thicker. And then we will save this as an SVG. And you'll notice that um, when we open that in our code editor, it looks a lot like what we had before with an SVG. This is if it's a standalone SVG, so we'll get rid of that. And then this is generator information, so we'll get rid of that as well. Um, and it has an X and Y, but these can be width. View box is useful if you're creating a map or something. You can use it to zoom around in it, or you can clip a graphic with it, but you don't actually need any of that. Um, And suddenly you get down to the basic circle that we had, which you can then take this and put it into some document and play with it. So the maps were actually, like the map where I was showing, here's a whole bunch of uh, streets built the same way. I took a map, map data from the city, imported it, then exported as SVG, and then by running through the SVG with D3, I was able to generate that kind of thing. So yeah, so you can start at either end, and I do both as well.
Yeah. It's building on top of JavaScript. So do you have any experience with like jQuery? Anything? No. Um, same idea. So in in normal JavaScript, you have to do like a document. Um, say you want to just get something on the page, you'd have to do document get element by ID whatever or right uh, with jQuery that would be and with D3 that would be this. Um, So it's still JavaScript underneath. It still works with JavaScript, but it's like just building on top of it. So instead of having to go through all the trouble of, okay, now give me some objects and now do this thing with them, sometimes there's issues with different browsers with selecting SVG elements because they don't all support the DOM or whatever. Um, with D3, you don't have to worry about that. You just say, here, go do this thing, and it takes care of it. It also means that you can specifically say, okay, now I want to, like, um, add some data to it, and you just add a data variable there, and then continue to do stuff with it. So. It works on anything as long as you don't have to support uh, IE 8 or below, which is Internet Explorer 8. Um, and yes, it is annoying, and yes, it is a problem. Uh, we have to deal with this all the time at work, and so what we usually do is we'll have like an image fallback um, that's just the straight image of here's the chart, and then when somebody, uh, because we have a lot of dentists that use older browsers and stuff, so if somebody actually does support that newer stuff, um, then we'll just use Modernizer, which is another JavaScript library. It also builds on top of JavaScript. Um, you can just say, okay, if they support SVG, then let's go ahead and put this SVG in there, and we'll replace it. So anything that's new, any phones, any tablets, any computers, anything like that, it'll work with. Um, and you do the same kind of thing where I'm transitioning between different states. You do the same thing for, okay, now as the browser gets narrower, keep track of how wide the browser is and readjust things. Um, and that works like that. So it's like, uh, if we go here, again, a super simple chart, but... Um, So here we have basic line graphs, but uh, the huge advantage is when you squish down the browser or something, it'll actually just adjust the line graphs for you. Um, right, right, yeah. So everything we do pretty much is responsive except for this website because we haven't been allowed to change it yet. Um, but anything new that we're doing is all responsive and we build it with this from the beginning. So you build the initial chart and then you just build the stuff that'll change the chart when the width changes and that's not actually that complicated. It basically involves redrawing the graph each time, but you just use a function loop for that. So you say the browser width changed, redraw the chart at this width, and that's it. So with D3 specifically, I did propose it, but they've been working on a lot of different things like that. Um, we, we have a very small web team. It's really actually, there's a total of three designers, including myself. Um, and there's, there's definitely a lot of different infrastructural issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis of, oh, this thing's coded in like some old version of Java and we can't update it or whatever, and so we do have to deal with that. But as much as possible, I, I mean, all of us are relatively modern web people and we know how to actually build stuff. And so whenever we get the chance, we start putting it in there and building stuff that makes more sense to us. It's just, that's just how we try to work, so. <laughs> Well, what was, do they have, like, a less modern website before? Um, with this particular website, there's only some minor changes that were made recently. We converted a lot of stuff to CSS instead of being images. This site was super image heavy. 
Um, the, all the charts prior to doing them in D3 were all done as static images and then generated out of, like, they were usually drawn using Excel and then they would export vectors from that and then use that to generate the image assets. Uh, but we also, as a healthcare company, there's extremely strict requirements around like how accessible things are. And so any time that we can improve the accessibility of some particular piece of the site, we have to do that legally. Um, and actually D3 is one nice thing where you can do that because like all of this text is real actual text. It's not, this is not a static image with like a tag that set, tries to describe this image or anything. It's real live stuff. And if we have to go update this data, we can update the data file and the chart updates. And those two major changes mean that it goes a lot faster for us. It's a whole lot less redrawing and everything. And we actually also like D3 because we, um, because we have to build everything for virtually every different platform and try to make sure that everything still looks good and stays sharp and everything. I, when, say, for example, we're building that annual report, um, it's not super image heavy, but even with that, it's still somewhere over 100 image assets for it um, because of all the little icons that you have to do, all the states of all those icons you have to do, and all of the different resolution exports because, like, there's... We actually don't support every different size of Android because they're just not that popular. And Like, we do support all of the standard Android devices, but we don't support, like, ultra-high DPI or anything. We try to, like, prioritize based on what we see in terms of visitors. We have analytics on everything. We can pay attention to that. But, um, but even so, we still export three different resolution assets for everything. So... Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would definitely look at doing basic JavaScript. I uh, just the super, super simple basics, understanding what objects and arrays and that kind of stuff are, because that stuff is incredibly useful when it comes to being able to import data and manipulate it. Uh, which is actually one of the things that I really, really like about D3 is I can go in and just say, oh, I have data in one format, let's just convert it automatically to a different format, and then I don't have to ask anybody to do that. Um, but this site, d3js.org, uh, is the, it's the main site where they have tons of examples you can look at. Um, every one of these examples, pretty much, you can see and play with it, see what it does, um, and then they actually have the code right down below that explains how it works and how to actually build it. So, like, if you're building a force-directed diagram, you don't have to start from scratch and figure out how all of that works. You can just take what they did, try to get your data into the same format, and stick the right variables in, and you end up with that chart. And yeah, um, so this is definitely a place I would look. Uh, dashing D3 dot uh, org, I think. If you Google Dashing D3, they they also have a lot of different tutorials on it, and then there. It's used by the New York Times a lot. Um, the creator works there now. He used to work at Square. Uh, and um, so looking at some of their samples, you can sometimes just poke through the code because you can just get to it right there. Or uh, he gives a lot of different talks and stuff. You can Google videos of him. And uh, his name's Mike Bostock. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, that's mostly where I've learned it. There's some good books. There's an O'Reilly book, I know, that uh, covers it, but I don't remember the name of it at the moment. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, if you have any experience with any other JavaScript libraries, that helps a lot because it works in pretty much the same way. The syntax probably looks really familiar if you've done any jQuery or anything. It's very, very similar. <laughs>